me if you can hear me. Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Dee O'Neill. I head up our corporate and executive programs here. Wonderful to see so many familiar and lovely faces. Who's been here before to a SIPS and Science? Show of hands. Wonderful. And who's here for the very first time in the building? Great. We love to see new people in the building. Welcome. Um, I'm going to do a couple of housekeeping items. If you want to get up during the session at all, please use the two doors on the very end under the exit sign. And then lastly, as soon as the illustrious Dr. Ian Robert, uh, Robertson finishes this evening, he's headed off to a dinner. So he'll be whisked away. I know I'm so sorry. But any questions, please email us or him, and we'll get back to you. But please um, help us just let him get to a lovely dinner afterwards. Dr. Sandy Chapman. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm Dr. Sandy Chapman, the Chief Director and Founder of the Center for Brain Health, the Brain Performance Institute. And we hope every one of you care about your brain health and that you will have a brain health physical before the end of the year, unless your most important organ doesn't matter to you, which we think it does, so you wouldn't be here tonight. I have the good, good, good fortune of introducing one of my most cherished partners, collaborators, brainiest persons in the whole world. I got to meet Dr. Ian Robertson after reading a few of his 250 articles, uh, many of his chapters in science books, his two books, The Winter Effect and The Stress Test, which you must, you must, must go on Amazon and get the stress test because I know everyone here feels stress. I got to meet him and instantly we knew we were soulmates because we looked at the brain in a paradigm shift because right now almost every single person looks at the brain in terms of what's wrong with your brain? What's wrong with your brain? Or else we don't focus on it. This scientist who is head of, he started the whole neuroscience program at Trinity, Dublin, although he's not Irish, he's actually Scottish, but it sounds wonderful whichever way it is. Uh, he has been recognized as the fellow of the American Association of Psychological Sciences. Very rarely do people get voted into that except for their outstanding science. When I asked him to come on board to join me in the Brain Health Project, he said, Sandy, I will be there because this is something that's going to change and raise the whole level of humankind who wouldn't want to be part of it. And now you are. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ian Robertson. Okay, thank you, thank you. No, I didn't need that. Thank, you. thank you, Sandy, for that very generous introduction. And what a privilege to be here. Imagine there was something that could make you happier healthier, more long living, physically stronger, more persisting, more motivated, more creative, more popular, and more influential. Imagine, you, you clean up, you invented it, but it exists, it does exist. And it's called confidence. Because confidence is the critical faculty with strong scientific evidence for its effects in every single one of these domains, right down to physical strength. So today, I want to talk to you about how we understand this beast and harness it to use the confidence trick. Now, confidence is not optimism. Optimism is hoping for the best. It's not self-esteem. Self-esteem is thinking well of yourself. Nor is it hope. Hope is an aspiration that things will turn out better. No, confidence is something different. Confidence is something that empowers action. Confidence is related to action. And it's our bridge to the future. 
In fact, confidence is what makes us distinctly human. I think there's many faculties that no longer distinguish us from other species, including problem solving, tool using, and even reasoning to some extent. But confidence makes us distinctly human. And what is confidence? Confidence is the ability to envisage something that does not yet exist in the world and to work in a motivated way towards achieving that something that does not exist. That is remarkable and unique in the known world. Now, let's start to do a little bit of dissection of the anatomy of confidence. And there's two main limbs to confidence. One of them is the can-do branch of this bridge. Because remember, confidence is a bridge to the future, to something that does not yet exist. And the can-do part of that bridge is the belief, because confidence is a belief, that you can do whatever action it is that you're talking about or thinking about. But the other strand, what is the other strand? The other strand is can happen. And that is the belief that if you do that thing, then consequences will follow that you hope for. So for example, you can uh, wish that you could Stop smoking. That's the can do. And, and believe you can, okay, I can stop smoking. But then there's the other belief you have to have, which is that stop, stopping smoking will have some positive effect. Okay? I don't believe it. I don't believe stopping smoking will, will do anything. My grandfather lived till he was 100, and he smoked. That kind of argument. So there's the can, happen, the can do and it can happen. So if you then take these, you can then do a bit of an analysis of confidence. And you get four patterns of confidence, or lack of it. And here we have the can-do, can't-happen person. No, I can't stop smoking in any way. Nothing's going to happen if I do. Or, no, I can't. I'm no good at school. I can't get. I can't study, and anyway, if I do study, there's going to be no benefits of it anyway. Or, no, I don't think I can lose weight, and anyway, if I lose weight, I don't believe it's going to have any effects on my health. Okay? That's can do, can, can't happen. Then you've got can do, can't happen. Yes, I could do that, but, but the outcome's not going to happen. Okay? Yeah, I could stop smoking if I wanted, but I don't believe it's going to have any effect. But then there's can't do, can happen. Yes, I know that if I could stop smoking, I know that I'm going to live longer and going to be healthier, but I just can't do it. And then there's a fourth one. Can do, can happen. The full, the full complement of the confidence bridge to the future. And different emotional and brain patterns follow from these four. So this one is our apathy, OK? And there's many hundreds of millions of the people in the world who are in this state of apathy. They feel they don't have confidence to be able to do things, critical things themselves, and they don't believe, they don't have a belief that the outcome will follow even if they could. Can do can't happen. I can do it, but it's not going to happen. That leads to frustration, and frustration leads to anger. It's a sense of being thwarted. Can do, can can't do, can happen. I know if only I could cut down my sugar intake, I could improve my type 2 pre-diabetes. But I just can't do it. And that leads to anxiety and sometimes to sadness and depression. And for the can-do, can-happen, of course, you get activation. Activation is motivation. And there are chemical changes in the brain associated with these four states. So 
in a state of apathy, the single feel-good reward motivation network in your brain, called the, the reward network, deep in the middle of your brain, your dopamine levels go down. And there's that sense of apathetic drifting of everything is so, so, this, this feeling of disempowerment. And that is chemical changes in the brain. It's not the chemical changes that cause the apathy, in most cases. It's the apathy that cause the changes to the brain. And then for anger, we've got norepinephrine. Anger, of course, by definition, is part of the fight or flight system. A common system for anger and for anxiety. It's the same system. When we're very fired up, either with fear or with anger, our brain floods with norepinephrine, which in moderate doses is really good for us, but when we get too much of it, it interferes with brain function. Okay? And has bad effects in the long term. And then, of course, there's activation. If we believe we can do something, we believe some, that thing can happen, then that increases dopamine levels in the reward network, lifts our mood, and makes us motivated, able to persist, able to take that action across that bridge to the future. And this effect plays out in our brain. Here, the left side of this circuit, the anterior cingulate of the brain, in apathetic people is firing at a very low level compared to people who are very motivated. And then here in the amygdala in the brain, the emotion center for both anxiety and anger. And when we're in a state of anxiety or great anger, that's sending out huge signals into the brain and disrupting a lot of our problem solving and rational thinking abilities. So confidence is important. Confidence is possibly the most important phenomenon in determining our brain state and therefore de determining how we and what we do in our lives. Now here is a confidence statement if you ever saw one. <laughs> By the end of the decade, we will put a man on the moon. It's 1961. That was a ridiculous statement, not of one man, but of an entire country. An entire country decided they were going to create something that did not yet exist, and they didn't even know how it was going to exist. But we can do it, and yes, it can happen. And by goodness, it happened 50 years ago extraordinary achievement of the human capacity for confidence. And look above you. Look above you. And that's where we are. We're in this place that one woman, Dr. Sandy Chapman, envisaged a place where we could put into action a completely new way of thinking about the brain and with the help of many people in this room and many generous people in Dallas and beyond, managed to create that bridge to a future, to something that nowhere else in the world exists, a building such as this, with aims such as this. And this is the frontal lobes of the brain, the building designed around that. An extraordinary achievement of this capacity to build a bridge to the future. And that bridge is towards getting control, maximizing the use of the 100 billion of these brain cells that are in each of our brains, that are connected up to 20,000 times with other brain cells, and with a pattern, a, a, the impossible number of computed patterns of connections in the brain exceeds the number of atoms in the universe. This is remarkable. But in order to understand how this works and to maximize its functioning, we have to understand not just at the molecular level, 
but to the level of the whole system of the brain, which is what is happening in this baby. So what is the greatest obstacle to this bridge to the future? What is the greatest obstacle? Fatalism. The belief that you don't have control. That is the corrosive acid of, of uh, confidence. Imagine President Kennedy and all these people, all the engineers, all the American people who came behind the president. Imagine all of them had said, and you know, nobody's gone to the moon. How we can't do that. You know, how, you know, man wasn't designed to go to the moon. No, a, a fatalism, a belief you can't control things would have completely sabotaged that effort. Now, let me give you an example of that in practice. Now, this is a study of um, people in their mid-60s. Now, these are, these are British people in their mid-60s. If it was Texas, they'd look 30 years younger. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, these are, this is just a photograph. They're actually a bit older. But, so I want you to think, imagine that you're in your mid-60s and you've been asked to go to a, uh, a, a, a research study at the University of Exeter in England. And you go into the room and um, you, you're told you're going to be given an, a, an assessment test of, men, of cognitive abilities, a little um, uh, screening test of the type that your family doctor would use, give you, if you went and said, I'm a bit worried about my memory. Uh, it's like there's, there's various ones. This one's called the Addenbrooke's Cognitive Assessment Scale. It's used across the world. There's other ones like the mini mental status. Doctors have them in their drawers. And if you go and say, I've got a memory problem, they'll say, okay. And, and they'll ask you some memory questions and some reasoning questions. Okay. And you, in this particular one, the, the Addenbrooke scale, if you get less than 82 out of 100, then the doctor goes, oh, okay. This research shows there's an 87% chance that you will be having some neurodegenerative condition. So if you get below 82, I'm referring you to the clinic for further assessment. So anyway, that was what was happening to these people at the end of the study. But first, what they did was this. They told, they lied to the 60s, mid-60s people. To half of them, they said, you are the younger group of a group of 60 to 80 year olds. Okay? So you're in the younger half of our sample today. They weren't all in the same room together. And to the other half, he said, oh, you are in the older group of a group of 50 to 70 year olds. Okay? So one group were told to feel old, made to feel old. One group were made to feel young. But there was one other critical manipulation. Within each of these two groups, Half were told, were given an article to read, an authoritative article to read about aging. And that article, one of one groups, well, half of them got to read this article, which said, aging is associated with a specific problem with memory. Memory goes down and you need more memory aids as you get older. The other one said, aging is associated with a general loss of cognitive functions. Okay. So here we ended up having these, these 65 year olds, mid 60s people, had four groups. One group, so one group, half of them were told they were younger, half of them were told they were older, and then within each half, some were told aging is specifically a memory problem, and half were told there was general cognitive decline. Okay? So having done that, they then gave them the Addenbrooke's Cognitive Assessment, the doctor's screening for dementia, okay? And they were looking for how many people were below the cutoff score of 82. So here was the first. The people who were told they were younger, and there was a specific memory deficit, 22% of them uh, came below 82, okay? Which is... Uh, not, you know, kind of what you might expect in a not particularly healthy population in, in, in England of, of people of a whole range of socioeconomic backgrounds. 
Um, the ones that were told they were younger in the general decline, actually there was no, no significant difference, 16%. So that's not, that doesn't, these numbers don't differ from each other. Those that were told they were older, and it was specific to memory, only 8%. Again, that's not a significant difference. Okay, so just assume there was no difference between these three groups and how many of them, because there was maybe 20 per group. However, the group that were made to feel old and were made to feel uh, that, believe that aging was a process of general cognitive decline. 70% of them would have been with a heavy heart on the part of their family doctor referred on for probable dementia. What is going on here? Fatalism. Fatalism. Fatalism about your own behavior and your own cognitive state. Think about it. Not only are you old, with all the baggage that goes with that, the, the stereotypes and the prejudices and ageism that goes with that, but yeah, you, generally you're losing, you know, ever. <laughs> and not much hope, at least if you're told your memory is specific. Oh yeah, yeah, my memory, I'm, I'm not so good at remembering, but yeah, I have to make more lists and I have to make use of my phone and all that. But no, general law, oh, no, no. So there was a sense in which control was taken away by the aging stereotype and by this belief in these, this group of naive people. They had no, haven't the kind of background you have all got in coming here. These were people who didn't know much about the brain. So fatalism about age, fatalism about our cognitive abilities, Fatalism about our emotion. Because this is not just about aging and cognitive abilities. We have a, an epidemic of anxiety. Okay? This is fatalism about our emotions and fatalism about the brain generally. Remember, the greatest corrosive of the human being's greatest capacity for confidence is fatalism and the loss of control that that implies. So now I want to tell you a little bit about how confidence works in the mind. And the first I've just told you about, confidence as a badge. Confidence as the perception of yourself that you incorporate to a greater or lesser degree in your own mind. There are plenty of older people who sniff, many of them in this room, who have contempt for normal uh, cultural beliefs and preconceptions about what aging involves, okay? But a lot of people are not immune to them. It's a, it's a badge they wear that, that wears them down. And, and there's, there's evidence that the more negative your beliefs about aging are, even in your 50s and 60s, over a two-year period, you begin to walk slower than people who have positive, positive beliefs about aging. Your cognitive abilities go down more. And there's even a correlation with the amount of amyloid in your brain. This is Becca Levy's work in Yale. Now, that's not cause. That may be correlation other than cause. But the others is not correlation. Negative beliefs about aging, wearing the badge that saps your confidence leads you to behave in a way that is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that is the remarkable thing about confidence is it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's why it makes you happier, healthier, live longer, stronger. These are some of the badges that can sap our confidence and therefore sap our ability. Gender is a huge one. Women on average are significantly less confident than men and they pay for it in the workplace and they pay for it in a number of domains. Fortunately, that's changing a bit as we get confident role, more confident, more role models across 
industry and elsewhere. And it tends to, in that deficit between female and male confidence tends to diminish with age. But for much of their life, there's this big confidence deficit in women, which costs them, and costs, the, costs us, costs the country, costs the community, costs the world a lot. Race, obviously, as well. Class, socioeconomic badges that you wear that, that sap people's confidence and therefore saps their capacities, cognitive, emotional, and all the rest. Disability, physical appearance, physical appearance, height, looks, all of these things are badges that people incorporate and they, they internalize the, the, the cultural beliefs and other people's responses to them and then they start behaving in a way that corresponds to these beliefs. These are all the fatalistic badges that are the enemies of confidence. Okay, second way in which confidence works. So any golfers here? Any golfers? Okay. Uh, anyone recognize the British Open 2007 um, in Carnoustie in Scotland? Miserable weather, <laughs> freezing, blowing off the east, the east coast. But anyway, Porrick Harrington, Irish golfer, he was in the lead in the 17th hole. Sergio Garcia was close behind. And so he, was, he had the claret jug, the, the, this very, very esteemed golfing prize in front of his eyes. That's his caddy, Ronan Flood. And um, so in the 17th hole, he was top of the world, everything was going well, and he sliced the ball right into the infamous Barry Burn, which is a, a little river that runs through the, the course. There he is. There he is. Ah. So he's okay, he can retrieve it, he, he's, um, you know, so he gets back on, he takes the penalty shot. No! Into the Barry Burn, again, how could you do that, twice? His world fell apart, the claret jug fell from that shimmering prize onto the ground. He was in a state of feeling humiliated, he wanted to walk off the course. This is all his own self-reported testimony. And, yeah, I've, I've, I've mucked up. I've ruined it. I've thrown away the Open, one of the most prestigious golfing prizes. And he describes how Ronan Flood, as they walked the long walk up to the 18th tee, Ronan Flood kept saying to him, just one shot, you're the best chipper and putter in the world. Just one shot, you're the best chipper and putter in the world. You're the best. And he almost hit him. He had to, Flood had to take the golf club. He was almost hitting him. He was so enraged. But Flood kept that on at him. You're the best chipper and putter in the world. You're the best chipper and putter in the world. So they got to the 18th uh, hole, and he chipped and putted to a tie with Sergio Garcia. He retrieved it. And so he won the playoff. And he won the playoff and he won the Open. But that's not the end of the story because, and, and this, this now is a personal anecdote directly from Ronan Flood. Um, later, they were separated during the day and all the celebrations and the media thing. And they met in a car going to the hotel later that night. And Porrick Harrington said to Ronan Flood, you know, you really, you saved that for me. I, you know, I really was sure I'd just thrown away the open. I, I was sure I did not have a chance. And you believed in me. And Ronan Flood started laughing. He said, what are you laughing at? He said, I didn't think you had a chance either. <laughs> and Donald said, what? He said, no, I didn't think you had a hope. But he just said the words. He said the words. And words are incredibly important. They're incredibly important. Why? You say the words. I can chip and putt. What words can do is they channel your attention. 
And your attention is the gateway to everything in your world. Okay? So they channel your attention. And Ronan Plurd's words channeled Porrick Harrington's attention away from thoughts of humiliation, thoughts of the lost prize, thoughts about how stupid he was, thoughts about how was it that I uh, managed to do that twice into the burn, unheard of. And instead, it channeled his, the words channeled his attention, chip and putt, chip and putt, just one shot, chip and putt. So it controlled his attention. So now his brain, he, he had a clear goal, which was chipping and putting. And of course, if you have a clear goal and you manage to ward off all these other distractions, then you will achieve success. Even in the small, a small success, you know, doesn't have to be winning a championship. One, one good shot is a success, counts as a success. Of course, if you have success, you then get confidence. Confidence then leads you to be more likely to say words that convey confidence. Yes, I can. So that's how one just saying the words, and it's a tip for all of you, or your children, or your family. You may feel like a jelly inside. You may feel, I can't do that. But if you just say, particularly if you say it to other people, public commitment, I am going to cut down my sugar intake. Even though inside I say, no, 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 no. Even though the gut feeling is I can't do it. The saying the words actually is not guaranteed, but it's a critical element of confidence in the anatomy of confidence. That's what we're talking about. Now, in this building, in, in the Center for Brain Health, Sandy Chapman and her colleagues have developed this incredible way of training people, very, which some of you will have done, of training people to harness the capacities of their brain to be able to focus their attention in the way that um, uh, Porrick Harrington managed to do with the help of Ronan Flood. And the critical there is the frontal lobes of the brain, where we orchestrating the activity of the frontal lobes of the brain, which is where you screen out irrelevant distraction, irrelevant thoughts, where you dampen down the emotions of the amygdala in the frontal lobes of the brain where we're sitting just now, with these neurons there inhibiting the activity of parts of the brain that should not be in action. And just to give one example of one element of the SMART training, which is what Ronan Flood succeeded in doing with Porrick Harrington, and Porrick Harrington then managed to implement the power brain power of one, of having a single clear goal, uncorroded by distractions, okay? Uncorroded by distractions. Not thinking about the claret jug, the humiliation, the failure. Just all your mind, all you're thinking about is the chip. And of course, this is not just words. It's not just thoughts in the mind. This is the work that Sandy Chapman and their team have done, showing the changes in the brain of the orchestration of brain networks, this beautiful synchrony. And that's what Ronan Flood did to Porrick Harrington. He synchronized his brain in this way to allow him to do what he could do perfectly well as long as he wasn't allowing his mind to be distracted and the goals corroded by multiple irrelevant thoughts, feelings. Third way, to, as a distorting prism. Those of you in this room, hands, okay, I won't ask you hands. Those of you in this room who are not depressed are deluded. including me. What I mean by that is human being, the non-depressed human being has a slightly unrealistically optimistic view and expectation about how things will turn out. We all think we're above average drivers. <laughs> investment managers all think they're above average investment managers. 
Surgeons all think they're above average surgeons. It's impossible. Some of us have to be average, but we've got this bias towards positivity bias in the brain. And in fact, our brains are biased in order to, we, we update good news more than we do bad news in our brain, and that contributes to this bias. But this bias is what got us to the moon. This bias is what got us this place against expectation. It's a critical part of the human being's apparatus for getting up in the morning and doing these amazing things in the world. And how does it work? Well, if you're confident, if you're confident, overconfident if you're not depressed, then you expect success. The mere expectation of success causes your reward network in your brain to have an anticipatory increase in dopamine activity. Okay? You only have one reward network. That increase in dopamine activity is an antidepressant and an anti-anxiety drug. The most natural and beautiful anti-anxiety drug in the world. Just expecting success lifts your mood and reduces your anxiety. When your mood is better and your anxiety is lower, you will perform better. That will make you more likely to experience success, which of course will further boost your confidence. So you get this virtuous circle. Number four, how confidence works. It makes you do stuff. What do I mean by that? Well, here we have a negative cycle. If you've got low confidence, in, say social confidence, then you expect failure, you expect rejection. Okay? So that means in your brain, rather than anticipating success, you're expecting loss, lack of success, in fact, the worst, failure. So you get a decrease in dopamine activity in your reward network. That lowers your mood and increases your anxiety, which of course makes you perform more poorly. That then makes you tend to avoid and withdraw. And therefore, you don't experience success, and so that further exacerbates your low confidence. In fact, there's good evidence that chronically anxious people do less stuff. Doesn't matter what the stuff is, they just do less stuff. And doing stuff is pretty important in the world because it leads you to places where you, you see things or experience things that you otherwise wouldn't have done, including things that feel good and that lift your mood, okay? So withdrawal and avoidance tends to trap you in this low confidence cycle. How confidence work five, and this is one of the most important, help you feel in control of your emotions. So let me give you another cycle here. This is Mara Wilson, Mara Elizabeth Wilson, who was the child star in Mrs. Doubtfire and Matilda. And she said something very, very interesting. She said, later in life, I wish someone had told me it's okay to be anxious. Okay? Now, what does she mean by that? Well, it turns out that young people who never have experienced any adversity in their young lives end up more emotionally vulnerable than those who have had moderate levels of adversity. Severe levels of adversity is another story, but moderate levels of adversity cause anxiety. But anxiety usually passes, and if you do stuff, you usually manage to get through it, so you get a sense of mastery. Mastery is one of the great, mastery over adversity is one of the greatest sources of confidence. So you learn that anxiety declines. You learn that it doesn't go on forever. So you learn not to be fearful of fear. Fear of fear and anxiety about anxiety is one of the main engines of chronic anxiety. That allows you to feel in control because if you don't feel in control of your own mind and your own emotions, you won't feel in control of the world. And you're therefore better able to cope with adversity. Tiger Woods said, the day I'm not, I, I'm not nervous playing is the day I quit. He used his anxiety. It was necessary for him to perform. He wasn't frightened of it. And one reason he wasn't frightened of it was, 
And this is true of super elite sportsmen. The, the very top sports people often, this is true of, he was bullied for a stutter. He had a stutter as a child. He was terribly bullied. Only came out later in his life. And that combination of having a tough time earlier in your life, plus a success experience, he, was, he won the American Amateur Golfing Tournament and had some, several other big successes. That combination of adversity and triumphing makes people more likely to be super athletes because they learn not to be frightened of their emotions and therefore they can learn to harness them. Number six, and this is critical, this is probably the most important of a lot. Your, your theory about yourself, your mindset is critical for your confidence. I, you know, think about this. I mean, people have told me, I'm just an anxious person. I can't really change it. My mother was anxious. My, I, I'm just an anxious. No matter what I do, I can't really alter my tendency to be anxious. These are theories about yourself that are self-fulfilling. Because if you believe that, you won't then engage in the somewhat long activity it takes to learn to control anxiety. I just can't do math. The number of people that can't do math. Now, I want this, this is one that's very personal to me. I can't draw or paint to save myself. I was good in school, except in art. I was a complete dunce, bottom of the art class. And um, I remember this very, uh, he was, he was a, an accomplished painter, was our teacher. And he, he, the, the disdain I felt from him, my kind of five-year-old drawings when I was 13, 14. And so I spent 40, 30, 40 years just saying, I, I just, whatever part of my brain is, I cannot draw or paint. I'm just a child in this capacity. Um, you know, luckily, I was good at the other subjects, so it didn't kind of, but I cut myself off from a whole realm. And then, about four years ago, my wife said, oh, you'll have to, there was a group of us, we were doing a, a charcoal drawing class for a weekend. You have, we, need, we need another person to make up numbers. Oh, I cannot draw, how can I do that? So I went to this class, brilliant teacher, two days, and he taught you the mechanics of how to draw. And, and, and that's, that's what I, and now that's not good, that's not good. But my God, compared to what I thought I could do, compared to what, yeah, I'd cut for 40 years, because I had the theory that I was endowed with an inability to draw, I didn't learn the stuff. If anyone can learn to draw, literally anyone can learn to draw. And this, the belief, the lack of confidence held me back. And here Van Gogh, I mean, I'm not comparing myself to Van Gogh, my God, but, but there, there's, there, the, the, he said it, he said it. Okay, it's the words you say to yourself. So, I'm coming to the end now, can do, can happen. These, these two strands of this bridge to the future is the last frontier of human confidence, however. The confidence we can change our own brains. That's why this is at the forefront in the world. That's why the Brain Health Project, the Sandy is leading, is this incredible wave to change for the way we think change these preconceptions that are holding us back from maximizing our brain potential. We passed through the era of physics where we believed we were machines and we were controlled by, determined by physical laws, um, similar to those of Newtonian laws, etc. The high point of that was in the turn of the century, Einstein's theory of relativity, beautiful science. Then in the 1950, we get Crick and Watson with the era of biology. Now, we're controlled by our genes, okay? These are two types of fatalism. You know, our, our behavior, our personality, my mood, my anxiety, my intelligence, everything's controlled by my genes. What does that do? It's a kind of fatalism that subtracts your sense of control. I believe now in the 21st century, we've entered the era of mind. The currency of the 21st century is information. The, the medium for information is the human brain and human mind. All the major tech companies, the, the highest value companies, are in the domain of information. That's where we are. And yet, we are held back by this false belief that the capacities of the brain are entirely determined, and the, and, and the, the disorders of the brain are determined entirely by genetic biological factors. They're not. They're not. 
So here we have the fragile but feisty confidence that we can control our own brain against the, the fatalism, the, the great driving fatalism of the era of physics, the era of biology. We don't want to say these are wrong, these are wonderful, but we need to tie them in with the era of mind and realize that it goes both ways. Biology can change the mind, yes, but the mind can change biology. And in the Brain Health Project that we'll be launching in San Francisco on Monday, um, we are going to bring in the brain health physical five domains so that people now realize you don't just get your blood pressure checked and your cholesterol checked, you have to get your brain checked. It's the key organ of your body. And the health of your brain determines the health of every other cell in your whole body. And it seems now, in retrospect, why are we not paying attention to this critical organ? That's why the Brain Health Project is so critical. And just to, you have to believe in yourself. We have to believe in ourselves as a community are advancing this. But to do that, we have to be, you have to be you. Every single brain in this room, every single brain in the world is utterly unique. Why? You have 20,000 or so genes, and you have 100 billion neurons, and you have trillions of experiences. The brain is the most complex entity in the known universe. So the computational, what happens in that interaction between these 20,000 genes these trillions of experiences and these hundred billion neurons and their infinite number of connections, of patterns of connections, means that it's not possible to get two brains that are the same. So you can believe in yourself by being you, by finding that individuality in yourself. And if you do that, that is one of the greatest sources of confidence. And if you have confidence, then the moonshot is possible for you. Thank you very much. Yes. Time for a couple of questions. Are there a couple of questions? None? One or two? Thank you, Ian. Thank you. No questions? Yes, one in the back. Yes, Mrs. Robinson. Well, um, the, an the, the answer is we, we, don't, we don't know about the long-term effects of medication on the brain. We just don't know. Um, uh, all, I can say, all, I can say is, all I can say is the brain is plastic. The brain changes throughout life. And even if there are changes, longer-term changes caused by taking certain drugs over a long period, that doesn't mean to say that you cannot learn to change the brain in other ways. But the answer is we don't know about the long-term effects of, of um, you know, the, 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 these drugs when taken over extended periods. Yes? Have you also incorporated the brain gut theory? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the brain, of course, yes, yeah. Because you've got several hundred million neurons in your belly. You've got the microbiome there. And you've got the vagus nerve connecting the, the, the gut to the brain in a huge way. And uh, I think, I think the, the great strength of this, what we call the mind-to-molecule approach, is, which we hope to collaborate with our wonderful medical colleagues who are, who are more the molecule-to-mind approach to harness these two and to say, look, um, what happens in your brain will affect your microbiome, but vice versa, your diet your, uh, will, 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 af and, and your ex will affect your brain. So we need, we need to help doctors be healers again and take a holistic approach. The, the, the wonderful mechanistic advances they've made in specialisms have 
meant they've got so much to learn in a specialism, it's very hard for them to take a holistic view of the whole person. So that's a real challenge. But I think, I think you know, we know that doctors have a power, if they, if they embrace the role, that they, they have a healing power that goes beyond the specific technology that they're deploying. And I think we could make medicine a lot more rewarding for doctors if we allowed them to embrace that. You know, there are profound effects on the body if you combine it with the wonderful technology with that healing power. And that includes looking at diet, looking at the microbiome, et cetera. Yes. So that's a great question. Some people say they need music to be able to focus, and some people find it distracting, and it's absolutely right. There's, there's, because um, our, our ability to pay attention depends on the norepinephrine system in the brain. And if it's, if it's too low or too high, the levels of norepinephrine, our brain doesn't pay attention as well. So there's a sweet spot in the middle. And sometimes if you're a bit... Um, if you're, it's, sometimes it can be difficult to keep your attention when you're reading something that's maybe not that compelling. And so sometimes having some background music, as long as you're, it can for some people act as that extra little challenge to the brain to bring the norepinephrine up in a way that they can focus. But there's other people who are already at their peak, and if you give them music, it'll push them over to the wrong side of it. So it's very individual. And even, even within an individual from time to time. Yeah. Yes? When you're trying to help the teenager gain confidence, and you said just say the words. Yes. Is it better for them to have one set of words they say, or numerous sets of words they say? The critical thing is behavior is doing stuff. The critical source, the critical source of confidence is actually mastering something that that's within your slightly out of your comfort zone. And the saying the word can be a, a useful tool to, to get you into that, through that zone, okay? So, uh, so I would focus on the behaviors. I would focus on doing things that you feel uncomfortable with, but doing them in a graded way, not jumping into the, throwing the person into the pool, but trying to create a hierarchy. If someone is a bit socially anxious, maybe not going out much, you, you say, well, look, just go, and go, go down and have a cup of coffee and say a few words to the person that served you the coffee. That's your goal. And if, they do, if you set the goals in a way that gives them a sense of mastery, that will really be the, the main, well, the huge source of confidence of, of gradually, a number of these. But the words can help you actually do the stuff. The words can be help you focus your attention, to find the goal. Okay, I can do it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overplay the language. You have to tie it to the behavior. Sandy. Well, not yet, Sandy. I'll tell. I'll tell you when you're there. <laughs> you're not. You're not there yet. No, no. But you're absolutely right. Con confidence, because con confidence is very strongly linked to the dopamine system, is, is, uh, as well. Um, and you can have too much of it. You can have overconfidence, and um, overconfidence can lead to misjudgments and risk taking, um, and certain drugs lead to overconfidence, um, and, and certain pe some people power affects in such a way, or money affects in such a way to make them overconfident. Um, and that is, yeah, that's, that's, that's the, uh, the downside of it, for sure. I think um, Venus Williams uh, was interviewed when she was 14, 
by someone from Time Magazine in the interview. He, he, um, uh, she, she asserted, um, uh, yes, I'm going to be a champion at that age. And he said, how could you know that? She said, because I'm confident, I'm confident. She's, and she said later on, confidence can be learned. So I think, I think if you, if you can, you, 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 you make explicit to your children some of the processes of brain strategic attention, that you, you give them words to describe their mental processes. I think if you give people words to have an idea of that there is this thing called confidence, it's not something you have or you don't. It's actually something that's you know, like, like riding a bike. It's something you can learn, and there are ways of learning it. So I'd say that's the putting it into your curriculum in that way. Yeah. So the, the question is, so many people are on you know, medications to control their anxiety and anger, and can that be uh, controlled by confidence? Uh, no, no, the answer is no. You know, you couldn't, I can't just say, oh yeah, if we're all confident, we can do that. What, but what I can say is, if we can create the kind of societal change in mindset where we have confidence so yes, it's hard. We have the confidence to be able to, to use what we know about the mind to control the brain, to control the body. Then my belief is we can have a, a revolution in, in, in health and medicine where we become less reliant on them. But at the moment, the fatalistic heritage of the, the era of physics and the era of biology in particular is that we feel that these are ailments that are outside of ourselves and outside of our control, and therefore it makes sense to take medication for them, and in some cases, of course, that's necessary. But we should have the confidence to realize that actually we can do this. And if we do that, it's, it's not going to be easy. It's not just like that. It's, not, it's, it's the change in mindset that the Brain Health Project is trying to bring about. Say that again, sorry. Oh yes, the drugs are the drugs are more available than than than, than, than uh, programs to help change your brain. Absolutely. So, the, it's reckoned the American <coughs> Institute of Stress estimated between sixty and eighty percent of family doctor consultations are for stress-related problems. Yet only 3% of these people get a stress management program. The vast majority get medicated for it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what, that's what we want to do with the Brain Health Project. Ian, yes. thank you. Oh, one more. Sorry. One last yeah. one. <laughs> well, look, uh, when I'm 100, I hope, um, I, I, I hope I'm confident that I can you know, walk to the end of the road and back, that I, I can believe, you know, because I presume there's going to be some physical limitations. So confidence doesn't have to be a big thing as we're going to the moon. It doesn't have to be. Confidence is about projecting yourself into the future in any domain, no matter how small or big. And, and the confidence is about making sure you're not holding yourself back with badges about age or about disability or any other factor. Ian, thank you as always. Wonderful. Thank Put your you. hands together for thank Ian you. Robertson. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you for coming.